Testing, testing, one, two. It's Larry Downs reporting March 4th, 2022. Residents, tape tomb. Here to check out some hot tapes. Now let's just take a couple steps down here. Watch out for that cat puke right over there. Ah, that fucking cat. I'm sick of that shit. Oh, oh, that's sick. Right over here. This is exactly what we're looking for. Oh, no. Nah, get him. Get out of here. This is one of my favorite tapes of all time and one of my all-time favorite horror movie reboots, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2003. Let's enter the tape tube. What is up, fellow dudes of all shapes and sizes, and welcome back to another episode of The Tape Tomb, a show where we talk about some of my favorite horror movies. And this week, we talk about one of the most bizarre cases in the annals of my collection with The Texas Chainsaw Massacre from 2003. This, in my opinion, is one of the stronger films in the franchise, but I've been known for having a pretty wildly unpopular opinion. But guess what? I'm gonna double down on that one today. I think this is one of the best horror movie reboots ever! Directed by Marcus Nispel, who would go on after this to contribute nothing but blasphemy to the movie industry, to kill a multitude of other amazing franchises like Conan the Barbarian and Friday the 13th. And on the writer's block, we got Scott Kosar, who would go on to write the Crazies reboot and be a producer for the Bates Motel and Haunting of Hill House on Netflix. This was the first Chainsaw movie after a string of just terrible garbage, and we mean that lovingly, that seemed like it was breathing life back into the franchise again. It looked dark, gritty, aggressive, and finally actually scary with a nice change of pace from robot leg what's his name and whatever this was supposed to be. And although we didn't have Gunner or an extreme Excalibur chainsaw, we have Jessica Biel, Arlie Ermey, and one of the gnarliest Leatherfaces to hit the big screen. But what's this movie about? If I had to take a stab at it, a Texas Chainsaw Massacre. But with this franchise, we gotta be a little bit more specific. Roll the film. Unlike our original gang, who probably had better taste in music, these guys are on their way to a Leonard Skinner concert, which is our first red flag that they should be chainsawed. But while cruising down the road, they see a woman in distress just wandering. So of course they do what anyone would do in a TCM movie and pick up the crazy old hitchhiker. They soon find out she's been a victim of some sort of attack, and when they refuse to change directions, she wigs out, pulls a gun out of her hoo-ha, and shoots herself. What a buzzkill. So our protagonists drive to the closest spot that they can find to inform someone of what happened. After a short interaction with some of the creepy locals, they're told to meet Sheriff Hoyt at the mill down the road. As they get there, they decide to split up and find the sheriff's house. As Aaron and Kemper investigate the house and everyone else gets to meet Sheriff Hoyt, who's a total asshole, it's very apparent to everyone that things are not what they seem. Turns out there are more occupants in the house than suspected as one scary as shit Leatherface hops into the mix, catches his first victim, and starts doing his Leatherface thing. On the other side of the farm, our group finds out that Sheriff Hoyt is actually part of some fucked up plan to kill all of them and that this chainsaw wielding maniac is actually a relative of his. It doesn't stop there, the whole town is actually in on it and our gang soon finds out that there is no safe place to hide. What will they do and who will escape? Hopefully at least Jessica Beale in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Now I know this isn't as good as the original, I get it, shut up, I hear all of you. And that's not a problem for me, I can appreciate the significance and history that the first one provides and still enjoy this one. The original is classic and can't be touched, but this new one brings the heat, even if it's a blatant copy without the soul and significance. I saw this movie when I was 13 and I was convinced at the intro that this was going to be one of the most bizarre cases in the annals of whatever movies I had seen so far. I just remember sitting through it and it being so fucking tense, my stomach was in knots the whole time. And these are the things that we remember about horror movies as we get older as they don't hit as hard anymore. We appreciate these moments and that's why I absolutely love this flick. What I do enjoy about this version is that we've expanded our haunted house setting to a much larger area. It added to the sense of there being no safety no matter who you turn to. Oh man, I'd like to run from that chainsaw guy and find the closest business human being or police officer. Uh-uh. And you find out way too late that everyone's in on it and you have nowhere to go. This movie really makes you feel for Jessica Biel's character, as if we didn't already. Arlie Ermey is fantastic in this movie. Unpredictable and erratic, he plays the part so well, constantly leaving these teens and the audience in a constant state of unease. And those eyebrows, man, you'd think he would took notes from Morgan Freeman in Dreamcatcher. Andrew Berniarski is an absolutely terrifying Leatherface. This guy is a giant killing machine that looks like he could just pick you up in a moment's notice and drag you away by your peeling fingernails. Ugh. For all these reasons and more, Texas Chainsaw is a perfect fit for us here. 
at the tape tune. Here's some facts about Texas Chainsaw 2003. Although the film's introduction and ending have it tailored to appear to be based on a series of true events, this is a total work of fiction. The film is inspired by the murderous acts of Ed Gein, a Wisconsin-based serial killer that was infamous for exhuming corpses as well as decorating his home with the body parts of his victims. Gein also confessed to wearing the tanned skin of a woman as a suit. To prepare for this role as Leatherface, Andrew Berniarski ate nothing but brisket and white bread to get up to his max weight of 300 pounds for the role. Dolph Lundgren was actually approached to play Leatherface before everyone else and he turned down the role to spend more time with his family, which is excellent because I couldn't imagine Ivan Drago running around with a chainsaw and killing people with a, someone else's skin on their face. The young group in the van at the beginning of the movie is listening to Sweet Home Alabama by Leonard Skinnerd. This film actually takes place between the 18th and the 20th of August 1973. That song was not released until 1974, featured on the band's album, Second Helping. Thank you all for tuning in to another episode of The Tape Tomb. I've been your host, Larry Downs, and if you liked this week's episode, make sure you click that like and subscribe button down below, or leave me a comment letting me know how I'm doing. Tune in every other week to our sister series, Airlock Shock, starring Nick Haskin. He talks about his favorite sci-fi movies, just like we do horror here at The Tape Tomb. Thank you all again for watching. This is Larry Downs. Stay spooky, my friends, and we will see you in the sequel.